Please welcome Dr. John Lutz. Thank you, John. Uh, we're coming up to Canada Day, and uh, Joseph W. Trutch, who I'll talk about today, is one of our fathers of Confederation. Um, I think the um, if anyone in British Columbia could be said to have played a pivotal role in negotiating British, uh, British Columbia's entry into Confederation, it's, uh, it's Joseph Trutch. And uh, of course, um, many of you are probably here because he's more notorious for his uh, treatment of First Nations in British Columbia. And of course, as, as John said, we acknowledge that we're meeting here on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and the Esquimalt peoples. Trutch has been in the news lately, um, a little bit. Uh, um, uh, He's, well, actually, this, this, this goes back to 2007, but um, the Beaver, uh, the Canadians uh, now renamed Canada's History Magazine, but then called the Beaver, had a short article on a Canada's Hall of Infamy, and Joseph Trutch was one of the uh, seven or eight characters in the Hall of Infamy, alongside John A. McDonald, he made the cut too, but so did John Diefenbaker for reasons that you all will have to puzzle out, I guess. Um, but uh, Trutch was in the news because the University of Victoria, more uh, fairly recently, last year, uh, renamed um, one of their residences, which had been named the Trutch Residence. And uh, as many of you uh, well know, there's been uh, some discussion about uh, changing the name of our local Trutch Street here. Um, so why? What are the issues around Trutch? Well, um, this series is called the Controversial Characters in Context because the fundamentals of historical research and writing is that we have to understand the past and the characters in the past in their context. It's a historical mistake that we historians call presentism to judge people in the past by today's standards. So for example, if we, if we thought everybody in the past was stupid because they didn't understand our technology and our medical systems today, if, if we thought that was stupid, that would be presentism because obviously we can only know what our society uh, knows. Uh, another example, we can't single out characters in the past that didn't support the idea of human rights if the notion of human rights hadn't been coined, for example, or invented or gained currency uh, in their time. So we can observe people in the past, but we can't judge them against a standard that no one applied or was aware of or would not have made sense in their lifetimes. So our intent here with this series is to talk about these characters in their context. And to understand people in their context, were they typical? Were they ahead of their time? Were they on the fringe? To do that, it's helpful to know what their contemporaries thought about them. And so I'm going to give you a couple of quotes to start off with uh, some of the contemporaries of Joseph Trutch. Uh, one of them, Gilbert Malcolm Sprout, sometimes an adversary of Trutch, uh, posited Trutch as kind of a mystery. He said, um, and this is quoting now Trutch's story, his story on the Pacific seaboard reads like a romance, though he was personally thoroughly unromantic. He goes on to kind of pose the, uh, the mystery. An ordinary surveyor in middle life, not long in the colony, appears suddenly in a close official circle and in six years becomes lieutenant governor of the province with a large, abeyant Canadian life pension and by and by is knighted. When he arrived in BC in 1860, he had no more notion of being within a comparative sh comparatively short time a lieutenant governor than I had of being the Archbishop of Canterbury. So Trutch arrives in BC and as uh, Sprout says, in a very short time shoots the top of local society. Uh, one of his um, colleagues, I guess, at the time of his uh, arrival, Walter um, Moberly, later uh, well known as a surveyor in the Canadian Pacific Railway Surveys, described Trutch in the 1860s as a fine fellow, a thorough businessman, and an honest one too. Rara avis in this country. I had to look up rara avis. One of the fun things about doing historical research is you learn new words all the time. So rara avis means literally, well not literally, figuratively, as rare as hen's teeth. And John A. MacDonald, who should know an honest man when he sees one, described Trutch as a man of high honor and integrity, whose advice was always dictated by a regard for the public interest. So that was some of his contemporaries. And then historians of British Columbia have had a look at Trutch, and uh, the early ones uh, thought very highly of him. Uh, so this uh, summary from a 1913 history of British Columbia. Um, Trutch, he was a man of more than ordinary ability who combined professional knowledge with practical business experience and capacity. From his former connection with the governor, government as chief commissioner of lands and works, he was familiar with all the details of government machinery, 
He also had a peculiarly, peculiarly, I can't say that, but you know what I mean, practical mind and possessed a sound and evenly balanced judgment. So that was pretty much the, the description of Trutch, I think carries on pretty uh, well through the 1950s with Margaret Ormsby's uh, History of British Columbia. But uh, the kind of historical thinking about Trutch starts to shift in the 1970s and primarily a thanks, in fact, I guess, uh, putting it bluntly, exclusively thanks to Robin Fisher, who wrote this uh, important book in 1976, 78, uh, Contact and Conflict. And Robin um, uh, uh, focused on uh, Trutch's Indian policy. And as I mentioned earlier on, he also wrote the Dictionary of Canadian Biography entry. Um, and then in 2007, going back to this, Don, uh, Daniel Francis wrote, Trutch's place in the Hall of Shame is secured by the seven years he spent as British Columbia's Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works. It's here that Trutch did maximum damage. So this evening I want to uh, ask, uh, will the real William, uh, sorry, Joseph Trutch, Joseph William Trutch, please stand up and explore the idea of why we have a street named after him. Uh, this man who was both born in, 19, in 1826 and died in 1904 in England. So a little bit of a background down. Who was Joseph Trutch? Well, he was, as I said, born in England, but his parents at the time were living in Jamaica, and his father was back and forth from England to Jamaica. His father was a lawyer, started out as a soldier, I think became a lawyer um, in, in Jamaica, and his younger siblings, John and Caroline, were both born in Jamaica. In 1836, his family returned to England where the boys were schooled and apprenticed as engineers, and, and Joseph uh, had a knack of making connections and connecting with just the right people. Um, I, I, I don't have this in my, my talk, but uh, Gilbert Malcolm spoke, kind of raised the question of, was he a toady? And he answered it in the negative, but it was maybe ironic in the way he, he answered this. So you get to judge for yourself. So Joseph's knack of uh, connecting with important people, his first job was as an apprentice uh, surveyor engineer with Sir John Rennie, a famous engineer then working on the Great Northern and Western Railways. This is the age in Britain of great railway expansion and surveyors and engineers, of course, were in their heyday and um, uh, Sir John Rennie was one of the leaders. But around this time as uh, John graduates, sorry, as Joseph graduates from uh, uh, engineering school and his brother John is in the midst of engineering school, his family falls on hard times. And uh, a daughter later describes the father, William, as a bit of a wayward character. Um, and at this time, she says, he's showing his less estimable, estimable, <laughs> estimable qualities and was creating a great strain both on family funds and patients. This is the dad. He was reported, this is by the daughter, to be, quote, a rake, Dickens style. His story voiced in hushed whispers as he became the sucker of his son's early earnings. So at this time, uh, Joseph's father, these boys are just getting uh, started in the work world, always needed money. He wanted his sons to support him, and it could be quite a trial, she said, when they withheld funds from him. So by age 25, home life was becoming less bearable for Joseph, and the, in 1849, the California gold rush broke out, and uh, Joseph uh, headed out for California. And he had a commissioner to help build a, um, a warehouse in California. 1849 is just chaos in California, and the gold rush has just broken out. Uh, California, uh, it's worthy a study of itself, but uh, San Francisco was a lawless place in 1849. So uh, home life was becoming unbearable. Joseph leads lights out for California. He doesn't like California. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, too lawless. Uh, he was also very homesick. And, and um, the other day, uh, a colleague, Jeremy Weber, asked me when I told him I was doing this, he said, is there any redeeming qualities to Joseph Trutch? And I said, well, he loved his family, I said. And, and so uh, he was terribly homesick when he got to California. And he wrote this uh, letter back. Um, and remember, in these days, this, these kind of letters can take six months. He writes his parents. Can you fancy my delight? my rapturous enjoyment in seeing once more your handwriting and hearing news of you all. You may form some idea of my feelings when I tell you I have been guilty of the lover-like folly of kissing those letters over and over again. They showed me that I was not yet forgotten to those I love so dearly, not so sorry an outcast as I had brought myself to believe. I am becoming quite unmanned. And he goes on to talk about how weep he is and how, how well, basically how he misses his parents, how homesick he is. He writes, 
Things aren't going well for him here in California, but he says, and now I'm quoting from uh, Joseph again, if I could get known among the best people, I mean capitalists, I should be sure to do well. And that was a prophetic statement, actually. So as I said, within a few months, he moved to Oregon, and he connected with John Bauer Preston, who was the surveyor general there, and a mem member of a prominent Illinois family who had come out to do work uh, in Oregon. And Bauer hires him on as a, an assistant surveyor, and things are going well, so Joseph invites John Trutch to join him, and John, also a surveyor, comes out to Oregon. Matters at home were not going well, so uh, Joseph gets a letter in 1853 from his mother. It's four weeks today, she says, since your father was arrested and placed in White Cross Street prison, debtor's prison, where he is still. During the whole of this time, he's written me almost daily the most harrowing letters with accounts of varied miseries blended with the condemnation of Carolyn, youngest daughter, appealing to me to urge them to have him removed from jail. Uh, we don't know too much about the family finances, but we know they're not going well. So 1855, he's been in Oregon a few years. Uh, Joseph marries the boss's sister-in-law. Uh, and so he becomes the boss's brother-in-law. Uh, as we saw with John Rennie, he had the knack of making the right connections. And soon thereafter, soon after 1855, uh, Joseph and his new wife, Julia, uh, moved to Illinois, where they get work for his uh, brother-in-law, uh, Bauer, working on the Illinois and Michigan Canal. The newlyweds took one trip, as you know, if you're a newlywed and you're in Illinois, where do you go on your honeymoon? Well. Niagara Falls, of course. And so uh, John, uh, sorry, Joseph, I gotta my, keep my brother straight. Joseph and Julia head up to Niagara Falls where um, Joseph is impressed by this bridge, which uh, he, uh, you'll see, took some ideas from and brings to British Columbia. It's my view that Joseph took two things away from his American experience. Um, a me first entrepreneurial land speculator spirit, which would be very much in the air in California and Oregon, not so much, I think, at home in Britain where he was. Perhaps this was augmented by the fact of his family's failing fortunes and uh, the embarrassment of his father being in debtor's prison, but there's a real uh, uh, take, you know, uh, go for the gold, go for the gold ring kind of approach that he takes away, which I, I think is not so characteristically British, and we don't see it among as many of his fellow uh, British immigrants to British Columbia at the time. Um, the second thing he brings with him from California is his antipathy towards indigenous people. Uh, California at the time was actively uh, prosecuting a, a legal and in, uh, I would say to the extent that there's a government there, a government encouraged genocide against indigenous peoples in California. And when, he, and when Trutch gets to uh, Oregon, he writes his parents um, about the indigenous people. He says, they were the ugliest and laziest creatures I ever saw, and we should as soon think of being afraid of our dogs as them. And in this regard, uh, Trutch has much more in common, I think, with American sensibilities at the time than he did with the British Columbia fur trade elite in British Columbia, James Douglas, for example, who preceded him, or even the educated Britons who uh, uh, arrived around the same time in British Columbia, and here I'm thinking of Matthew Bailey Begbie, who both saw indigenous people, I think, as human beings who, uh, though were maybe culturally uh, lesser than British, everybody was culturally lesser than British in their view. In fact, as I'm sure um, Hamar will tell us in, in, uh, in September, um, one of Begbie's comments was he thought the indigenous people here were finer than the working class in Britain. So, um, so Trutch brings a different view. Now, when the Fraser Gold Rush hit uh, in 1858, uh, John had already moved up from Oregon, so the brother John had already moved up here, and he encourages Joseph to come out and join him here in this new British colony. They, both, they were both English through and through, and felt like the, uh, being under the American stars and stripes was, was an anathema to them, and they were, uh, Joseph was happy to come to British Columbia, but he took the long route. He went from Illinois, Illinois via London. And he went via London because he wanted to introduce himself to the colonial secretary and kind of get the proper introductions and get a recommendation. Uh, he wanted to be the surveyor general here. That was his wish. And so he asked for that position and was told that he was too late, uh, that uh, the Royal Engineers are being sent out and Colonel Moody was going to be the, essentially the chief commissioner of lands and works, the surveyor general. Um, 
Was it a coincidence that Trutch sailed back on the same ship as Richard Moody? I don't know if that was a coincidence or not, but Trutch had a way of being on the right place at the right time, and so he makes the acquaintance of uh, Moody on his way here, and uh, within months of arriving here, he has a $10,000 contract to survey uh, the lower mainland into 160-acre lots uh, from Moody. Likely around this time, 1860, and it's 1860, 1861, Trutch uh, purchases uh, land here in Victoria. So he uh, already comes with some resources. He buys 10 acres in the Fairfield uh, area, and he calls his house Fairfield. Not very original, because I think Douglas had called the kind of larger area, which he owned, Fairfield, and he sold a portion of it to Trutch. But he calls his home Fairfield, and the Trutches uh, themselves had no children, but they invited Carolyn out, and of course John was already here, uh, so the younger daughter, they invited the uh, younger sister, and, um, and, and both of, all of their mother uh, came to live with them. Uh, father drops out of the historical record after he disappears into prison. We don't know what happened to father, but clearly the family left him behind. Um, and Joseph, in 1862, was elected to the uh, Legislative Assembly of uh, Vancouver Island. Then it was a separate colony from British Columbia. And the house, Fairfield, became one of the social centers for Victoria elite. And let's see if I think I have, uh, here's John, his brother. Um, and uh, here's Joseph and family at Fairfield House. Um, so this was the scene of grand garden parties and dinner parties and grand balls. The house expanded to have eight fireplaces, 28 doors, and 36 wide expansive windows. Doors and windows seemed to be a big thing at the time. Uh, and it overlooked the 10 acres uh, uh, stretching out in the, the, it was up on a knoll and stretched out with views over to the Souk Hills. Trutch had a penchant for fine wine, expensive cigars, well-bred dogs, and horses. And it was said there was no finer view in Victoria than the sunset from Fairfield uh, House. The house, so here's a, another picture of the house with the Trutch family uh, on the lawn playing croquet. Uh, the house uh, still stands today. Let's go there. There's the house uh, today, 601 Trutch Street. At one of the soirees uh, in uh, Fairfield House, uh, Caroline meets uh, Peter O'Reilly, dashing young uh, gold commissioner at the time, and uh, in 1863 they marry. Um, later, uh, Peter O'Reilly becomes uh, Indian commissioner for the federal government, and later still becomes a judge. And uh, so I think in this, this scene here, we see uh, the O'Reillys and the uh, Trutches playing um, croquet together. Uh, a little bit of historical trivia, and uh, you know, historians love trivia. Um, this a desk on the right is Joseph Trutch's desk, which uh, lives today in Point Ellis House. So the O'Reillys together built Point Ellis House, which still stands today as an historic site. And if you haven't visited Point Ellis House, I really encourage you to do so. It's um, been restored, I think, to about a turn of the century. Uh, um, um, furnishings, I guess, and, and interior. Uh, and so one can get a sense of, I think, the Trutch life and the O'Reilly life very much by visiting uh, uh, the O'Reilly House, Point Ellis House. The picture on the left is just a dining room in the Point Ellis House. But this Trutch evidently, this desk was Trutch's desk, which I guess he uh, gave to um, Peter when he left uh, the province. And um, uh, evidently, in the 1970s, the owner, who was the last O'Reilly to live in the house, uh, found a key somewhere in the house and uh, knew that there was a secret compartment in the desk and apparently matched the key to the secret compartment, opened this compartment that hadn't been opened in, in 50 or 60 years probably, and pulled out a package of private letters from Trutch to McDonald, uh, Johnny McDonald. I'm not quite sure what happened to those letters. So the, I hope they're in the BC archives or maybe they're still in the attic of Point Ellis House. because. Uh, yeah, a mystery still. Um, so uh, the Trutch brothers, uh, surveyors, they become road contractors and they bid on uh, building, uh, helping build the Caribou Road. Uh, they get a $48,000 contract, which is a lot of money in those days, to build part of the Harrison Lillooet route um, to the gold fields. And then the Caribou Road, they, they get a contract to build a stretch from Chapman's Bar to Boston Bar. 
And these are big operations. They employed like 100 men on each of these uh, road building operations. So they're, they're moving lots of men and equipment and shovels and picks and feeding them. Uh, these are big jobs. But Truch's perhaps his most significant engineering feat in this time was the Alexander, well, here's the Caribou Road, uh, a picture of it on the left, but actually, apparently, the only picture we have of men working on the Caribou Road um, on the right. Not a great picture, but um, photography was still relatively novel in the 18th, uh, late 1850s, early 1860s. So, um, you know, recognize the resemblance, but so Trutch builds this bridge at Alexandria, the Alexandria Suspension Bridge, the only crossing of the Fraser River at the time. Incredibly, that bridge was constructed between June and September 1863. Uh, think about the, McDo the, 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 the Mackenzie Overpass or the, uh, the bridge over, uh, you know, the Harbor Bridge here. Um, it was a span of 268 feet, 90 feet above the river, and it was rated to carry three tons. And, and Joseph Trutch knew it would carry three tons because this is what he did. And you have to think about sibling relationships here. He loaded up a wagon with three tons and put his sister on the top to <laughs> test the bridge on the first day of the opening. So either he was very confident or he didn't have a great relationship with his sister. So, so obviously already doing very well financially, but the, uh, the bridge construction w uh, made him richer still. Um, Governor Seymour, who takes over from Douglas in 1864, reported that the tolls that Trutch received from the Alexandria Bridge are now worth about 4,000 pounds a year. Pounds are trading at $4.85, so we're getting close to $20,000 a year in tolls, and by comparison, the Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works, a job that Trutch eventually gets, paid 800 pounds a year. So he's getting 4,000 pounds a year from that bridge, and he buys a half interest in the new bridge at Spence's Bridge, uh, which also generated 4,000 pounds a year. So he's only getting half of, of that uh, interest. So um, he's doing rather well for himself. I quoted from Gilbert Malcolm Sprout earlier on, uh, and he's written a lovely little memoir of, of, of Trutch as he has of some of the other um, uh, figures of his time. And here he says, gradually Trutch had become more or less indispensable outside man in lands and works, business on the mainland, a faithful clock that never struck before its time, a nuncio who delivered with the fidelity of the errands, the errands of the gods. So a reliable character uh, as far as uh, the lands and works departments uh, goes. 1863, the Royal Engineers get recalled to Great Britain. And uh, Moody, guess who he recommends to be his replacement? Um, but uh, Douglas is not up for this because um, Trutch has too many conflicts of interest. He speculates in land, and of course, every bit of business or every bit of surveying he does past, uh, uh, past Alexandria Bridge drives traffic across his bridge and gets him more money. So he's got this serious conflict of interest. So uh, Douglas demurs and uh, doesn't proceed with the nomination, but uh, he gets replaced in 1864, and Governor Seymour uh, appoints Trutch, Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works, on the condition that he divest himself of his bridge. So Trutch's first suggestion was he will do that. He'll give it to his brother. And that didn't fly with Seymour. Uh, so he said, uh, I will get rid of it by and by. And as far as we know, uh, he kept the bridge the full seven years of his, uh, of his um, kind of contract, the toll contract that he had. Um, so Trutch's new uh, position as uh, Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works put him in charge of the Indian Reserves. And this is where his infamy begins. Trutch uh, denied the existence of the treaties signed in the 1850s by Governor Douglas on Vancouver Island, and he denied the uh, validity of indigenous or uh, Aboriginal title, which the treaties themselves represented. Governor Seymour uh, himself was after, when he, Governor Seymour arrived, he was aware that Douglas had this great reputation among the indigenous people, and so he, he on uh, the Queen's birthday uh, in 1864, he had this grand uh, event at uh, New Westminster and uh, invited all the uh, First Nations uh, chiefs from miles and miles around, from Butte Inlet up to, up to Clinton and uh, through the interior. They all came and he promised Seymour that he would not, because this is what they were concerned about, uh, touch their reserves, that Douglas had been good to them, uh, and he would not uh, touch them at all. And more or less immediately he begins to instruct uh, Trutch to uh, reduce the reserves. 
And uh, this was a view that Trutch supported, saying, this is Trutch now, I am satisfied from my own observation that the claims of Indians over tracts of land on which they assume to exercise ownership, but of which they make no real use, operate very materially to prevent settlement and cultivation. Trutch knowingly revoked reserves already set aside for First Nations, reducing them in some cases to 10% of the original. Well, James Douglas had instructed his officials on the mainland to lay out the size of reserves that the First Nations had requested. Trutch's instructions to surveyors were to interfere as little as possible with the lands already taken by whites, and they should retain, and here I am quoting now from uh, Trutch's letters, they should retain for the use of the Indians the sites of their villages and as much land around them as will in some cases be found expedient, both around their villages and at the spots where they have been in the habit of cultivating potatoes, as will amount to, the to in the aggregate of 10 acres of tillable land to each adult male in the tribe, together with a moderate amount of grazing land for those tribes which possess cattle and horses. Um, so 10 acres per person is what, or per, per adult male, per family, essentially, was, was what uh, Trutch was recommending. It just for context, at the same time, if you were uh, a, a white settler, you could preempt or homestead, essentially claim, m more or less free, 160 acres of land for your family at this time. Trutch was also no doubt instrumental in reversing Douglas's policy which allowed First Nations to preempt land themselves, 160 acres per family, as any white family could. So under Douglas's administration, it was possible for indigenous people, as non-indigenous, to preempt land. But um, uh, under the Seymour Trutch administration, that was uh, reduced, uh, re reversed. So this is um, the Fraser Valley, this is Sumas Lake, and these dark areas are the reserves laid out by Douglas. And this is the same area after the reserves had been shrunk uh, by Trutch. Uh, and uh, you can't tell very much, but I think you can tell that there are much smaller and actually there are more reserves, but they're all very small uh, compared to these very large uh, 6,000 acres, this Sawali uh, reserve here, and down to 600 acres uh, uh, later on, one that I know something about. And here, uh, Kamloops, uh, uh, Kamloops located here at the junction of the uh, North and South Thompson. This was the original reserve, and this was the later reserve. Uh, the reserve, as you saw, went all the way up to the Shushwap Lakes, and uh, after uh, Trutch and uh, others uh, were finished, uh, just a, a few postage stamps left around the lakes. And this happened as well in the Okanagan uh, and uh, in other places. So um, Cole Harris, who is uh, one of the experts, uh, perhaps the expert on uh, kind of settler indigenous relations in this period, and certainly uh, he's written a book called uh, Making Native Space. That's what it's called, isn't it? I'm looking at my historian colleagues in the, uh, yeah. He also did the resettlement of British Columbia. Um, anyway, Cole uh, reminds us that Trutch wasn't alone. In fact, in many ways, Trutch was quite typical of these, uh, this new wave of, uh, of immigrants. Um, for some of his colony, uh, for some of Trutch's contemporaries, including John Robson, who was the editor of the very influential British Columbia newspaper based in uh, New Westminster, Trutch did not go far enough. And this is quoting from Cole Harris now. For some, Trutch seemed rather soft on Indians and far too slow to reduce the Douglas reserves and adopt a firm policy that relegated, quote, backward and, quote, inferior indigenous peoples to their, he didn't say indigenous, just peoples to their proper place. So this was, uh, I mean, uh, Trutch's uh, main um, uh, claim to attention as uh, Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works. Uh, during the period, he also, though, uh, compiled what's now known as the Trutch Map, 1871, a really meticulous map to showing the kind of uh, uh, the geographical knowledge that had been acquired about British Columbia in uh, the period uh, under his uh, um, uh, Lands and Work Commissionership, if that's a word. So this brings us to 1867. In 1867, these uh, four eastern colonies came together to form Canada, and discussion began in British Columbia as to whether this colony should also join the new nation. And initially, Trutch, like most of the colonial officials, was opposed to the idea, also like Governor Seymour. Um, and then in 1869, uh, Trutch joins Seymour on the HMS Sparrowhawk, and they make a trip up to Metlakatla, uh, which is uh, um, near um, Prince Rupert, and at the time it was a model missionary village, and I'm, I, I actually I, I didn't 
take a chance to kind of look at the main motivation for going up. Um, but the two of them are traveling together, and on the journey, uh, Seymour suddenly dies on the ship. Uh, and it turns out uh, it was an overdose of his medication he was taking. He, kind of, he, just, uh, he took a bunch of medication, and then his aide gave him more medication, and he died. So um, Seymour dies on the trip. And why that's important here is it means a new governor is necessary. And so Anthony Musgrave was uh, appointed uh, by the British government to be the new governor of British Columbia. By this time, British Columbia had been combined. The two colonies, Vancouver Island and British Columbia, were back into one. And Musgrave was appointed because he was pro-Confederation. Um, so uh, Musgrave comes, and of course he entertains uh, the locals uh, at the Cary Castle government house. Uh, and wouldn't you know it, um, John Trutch marries uh, Musgrave's sister, Zoe Musgrave, who was sort of his chatelaine. He came on a, on a single man, so he brought his sister to kind of do the kind of chatelaine job, the entertaining job. And of course that didn't work for him because she lost uh, him to um, John Trutch. So here we have Joseph. He's brother-in-law to the governor, I guess, is that a brother-in-law relationship? I think so. And he's brother-in-law to Indian commissioner or judge uh, O'Reilly, uh, clearly uh, connected by marriage uh, um, very well. And uh, so it was that uh, Governor Musgrave appointed uh, Joseph Trotsch to lead the delegation of uh, three to go to Ottawa to negotiate British Columbia's entry into Confederation. Um, and uh, so I think, uh, and, and this is where Trutch plays a, a really critical role because actually it was Trutch who kind of just dreamed up the idea of insisting that if, as one of the terms of confederation, British Columbia should insist on a railway. Nobody else, uh, uh, Helmkin or Carroll or, or even Musgrave or others thought that was at the least bit practical. But Trotch, who had been a railway engineer and who traveled quite a bit back and forth and had uh, uh, by this time uh, been on the kind of uh, railways that's crossing the western United States, he knew it was practical. He suggested the idea. It gets embedded into the um, uh, British Columbia's conditions um, and uh, off uh, the three of them, Carroll, Helmkin, and um, Trotch go to, to uh, Ottawa. Um, and uh, they're surprised because not only do, uh, does Johnny McDonald and his, uh, and his lieutenant, uh, George Etienne Cartier, uh, kind of embrace the idea and the proposal for a railway, but they actually even uh, agree to kind of accelerate the, the, to the terms. Uh, uh, they would build it faster than uh, even British Columbia had, um, had thought was possible. And so um, uh, British, uh, uh, Trutch uh, returns to British Columbia with the, the, the terms have been accepted by Ottawa. There's a vote in the legislature. British Columbia accepts the terms. Um, Trutch goes back to uh, Ottawa to help uh, with the federal parliament passing uh, the legislation. And there's a hitch. Uh, John A. Macdonald's conservative caucus thinks he's gone off the deep end and promising to build a railway within 10 years. It's not practical. It's not possible. Too expensive. And so uh, his caucus is not going to back the premier, uh, the prime minister, Macdonald, in approving the uh, uh, the terms. And if the uh, terms hadn't been accepted in Ottawa, then they would have been thrown back to British Columbia, and the whole discussion about British Columbia entering Canada would have been thrown open again. So. Uh, McDonald, actually, I think with Cartier, uh, brings Trutch into the caucus meeting, even though he's not a member of caucus. And Trutch promises the Conservative caucus that British Columbia would not hold Canada strictly to the terms. Uh, that the, if the railway wasn't built in 10 years, if it was 11 or 12 or 13, British Columbia, he would make sure that British Columbia was OK with that. Um, Word got out later that he made this promise, and British Columbia was not okay with that. But uh, uh, because he made this promise, the caucus said okay, and uh, the terms of confederation uh, were passed. Trutch was likely the, um, the uh, author of uh, Clause 13 of the terms of, of confederation. Um, this is the unlucky 13. This is the one that deals with indigenous people. And he was very cagey in this uh, clause, uh, which promises uh, that the federal government commits to an Indian policy, quote, as liberal as the colonial policy of British Columbia. Well, of course, 
the policy wasn't liberal at all. In fact, uh, Canada and uh, federal officials were shocked in 1871 when they actually took over administration of Indian Affairs to find out that no treaties had been signed on mainland British Columbia and that many First Nations had no land reserved for them and others had reserves that in some cases amounted to only two acres per, per, per family. But Trutch's cagey wording meant the federal government actually had very little leverage when it came to improve the First Nations land base because all British Columbia had to do was say, well, that's more liberal than uh, what we had already before Confederation and you haven't committed to that, you've committed to it as liberal. So 1871, British Columbia joins Canada and we're going to celebrate, I guess, that day in a few weeks. Um, who's going to be the first Lieutenant Governor? I.W. Powell. Uh, who was a doctor here and well respected, uh, Powell didn't want the job. Who else? Well, uh, MacDonald writes to his Lieutenant Cartier, he says uh, about Trutch, our colleagues seem to have a great deal of doubt as to the policy of appointing him, even for a time as Lieutenant Governor. It could not be announced that the appointment was only a temporary one and therefore we must appoint him for five years. They say, and there is much force in the objection, that Trutch is known to have strong opinions as to the terminus of the Pacific Railway, and that he has property, the value of which will be affected by this election. His speech also as to the railway has caused great indignation in British Columbia. This, I think, is his promising not to hold the federal government's feet to the fire. And his appointment, it is feared, this is MacDonald saying, it is feared by himself, might cause the first elections to go against us. This would be most disastrous. But if we do not want Trutch as Lieutenant Governor, we shall certainly want him as a Senator or in some other public capacity. So back to Sprode again, who's talking about uh, um, Trutch. We have a picture of Trutch here. Let's, uh, let's go to Trutch. Oh, this is the two brothers though. Uh, can you tell them apart? John and Joseph. This is, uh, I wonder when they had family, you know, got together and Zoe and Carol or uh, Charlotte, you know, kind of, could they, could they tell the brothers apart? I don't know. But uh, there you are, John and Joseph. Um, and here, uh, Helmkin, Carol, and Trutch on their way to Ottawa. This is uh, uh, obviously a contemporary sketch by uh, Robert John Banks. And this is Trutch at the time of the Confederation debates in Ottawa. Um, although, the closer, the more I look at that, the picture, the more it looks like he's been pasted into that picture, but um, that is Joseph Trutch. And, oh, there he is as Lieutenant Governor. Spoiler alert. Trutch uh, is described, and here you see a picture of him, uh, this way by, by Sprout. A round-bodied man of average stature, ill-hinged about the knees, compact head with scanty fall of light brown hair, shrewd gray eyes, and a plain manner, curiously streaked with pompousness, yet it wasn't haughty, and he seemed always to be listening to the sound of his own voice, though usually what he said was to the point and cogent. There's kind of mixed messages in that review there. So it's not clear how and why MacDonald and Cartier overcame their reservations about Trutch, but it, uh, Powell declined the job. Uh, Sprode attributes the fact uh, uh, that Trutch got the job to the fact that he could actually, he knew enough to run the BC government before an election could be held because in fact that's what happens. Trutch was appointed Lieutenant Governor and there was no government uh, at the time, right? We had a colonial governor appointed by the Crown up until 1871, British Columbia joins Canada, there's no government. So the Lieutenant Governor is the government and so he actually appoints the first Premier and the first Cabinet until there's an election held and so uh, Sprout thinks that because um, Trutch knew the place he could do that and uh, he could also run the Lands and Works Department because he used to be Commissioner. Trutch interestingly enough accepted reluctantly uh, because he felt that it would interfere with the money he could make by building the railway which he was hoping to build, the, what became the Canadian Pacific Railway. But he does take on the job and uh, uh, MacDonald writes this to Trutch. I have gathered from you that your ambition is to be charged with, ev with the very interesting work of constructing the railway through British Columbia and the Rocky Mountains. I have not a doubt of being able from my influence with the board to secure you this appointment and I have as little doubt that the re remuneration will be fixed at a satisfactory rate. So, um, of course it didn't turn out that way. Uh, um, John A. McDonald gets caught in a bribery scandal uh, where he had promised uh, the railway a contract to American uh, railway interest in exchange for very generous donations to his campaign. And so in 1873, the McDonald government falls and uh, Trutch is abandoned. He's, he's lieutenant governor. He's not going to make any money off the railway. 
and he finishes his term in 1876. He has much debate about whether he's going to finish his term or not. He's totally bored by the job. He's not interested in the job. Um, so at the end, 1876, he retires, goes back to England. Then MacDonald gets re-elected. And MacDonald then appoints him to be the federal agent in British Columbia, which doesn't sound like a big job, but it's a federal agent who basically directed the railway contracts and ran the, the construction of the railway and the graving dock and the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway and all of those things. So MacDonald then, uh, sorry, Trutch then spends the period of 1885 to 1890, sorry, 1880 to 1890 as the federal representative in British Columbia. And in the middle of this period, um, he, he meddles as much as he can in Indian affairs because he's the federal representative in British Columbia and the federal government has responsibility for Indians, uh, according to the Constitution. And he has a run-in with uh, Matthew Bailey Begbie in 1885 when, as uh, at the federal representative, he starts to build immigration sheds on the Songhees Reserve. And the Songhees chiefs um, engaged a lawyer uh, and went to the Supreme Court of British Columbia to enforce their Douglas Treaty rights. Uh, and the Douglas Treaties uh, promised the Songhees uh, the, that they would have uh, their village sites reserved for their exclusive use forever. And um, Begbie found that, in fact, uh, building immigration sheds on the reserve was an impingement on the treaty, and he upheld uh, the treaty and uh, the Songhees rights, and uh, Trotsch was frustrated. So I'm getting to the end. Just prior to his retirement, uh, Trotsch was rewarded with a knighthood from a grateful queen. Uh, this man, who had practically fled England to escape his father's financial disgrace, returned when he retired in 1890, a knight of the empire, and wealthy enough to purchase an entire estate. And he joined a very few British Columbians who uh, gained a knighthood uh, from uh, their time in British Columbia. I can think of, uh, of course, Begbie and Douglas, McBride, Dunsmuir, Crease, probably there may be one or two others that were knighted by the Queen for their service in British Columbia. Trutch dies in 1904 in Somerset, England, uh, and at then, uh, locally, his 10-acre property, Fairfield, was subdivided and is now the heart of what we call Fairfield. It took a while to subdivide the property and you know, settle the estate, so it was a couple of years later when uh, the um, uh, developers were naming the streets in the new subdivision. Oh, there's Trutch the Mason, Joseph, Sir Joseph Trutch, 1896. And so uh, it was that in 1907, uh, the Trutch property is being subdivided, and um, they named the house, uh, sorry, the street that ran in front of his house, Trutch Street. The timing to me suggests that the street was not named after the Lands and Works Commissioner, or the Father of Confederation, or even the First Lieutenant Governor. Only when the property, only after he was dead and the property was being subdivided were they looking for names for the local streets and decided to call the one that ran in front of his house, Trot Street. So as I mentioned at my start, there's no biography, there's no book about Trutch. Trutch still awaits a biographer who will plumb his correspondence, dig into his estate, dig into his business uh, dealings. And so I think our context, our, the context of our understanding of Trutch is still imperfect. He was often thought of uh, by his contemporaries as a practical and honest man. And he may have been. He certainly avoided any of the scandal that plagued his friend MacDonald and several British Columbia politicians at the time. He did build a major part of the Caribou Road, shot to the top of colonial and provincial governments, and helped ensure that British Columbia became a part of Canada. But if he, if he was an honest man in business, he was dishonest in Aboriginal affairs. In retrospect, we know he lied about Douglas's instructions and policies, about treaties, and that he represented one spectrum of colonial mentality when it comes to indigenous people. Close with uh, two quotes, one from his contemporary, Sprout. The Trutch was safe, shrewd, capable, and even diplomatic in a way. In office, he was a notable somebody, courteous, painstaking, prompt, and he kept very good wine. He had a clear view of the realities of life that were visible from his own not very elevated pedestal, and a good notion of selecting those with which it was desirable to keep insistently in touch. And a more recent review from historian Robert F Robin Fisher, who described him as the archetypal colonist. Thank you very much.